So this is the COVID-19 version of the suturing workshop. If I sound funny, it's of course because I'm living and working in a mask. This module here talks about suturing in the setting of wound repair and closing uh, minor incisions such as that from a biopsy. Uh, the main reason that we talk about these things though is that in primary care, especially in a more rural setting, your clinic may in a sense, operate like the de facto community emergency room, and you'll have a lot of opportunity to do the kind of things that we're describing here. Everything pretty much I'm showing you is something I regularly do at my job over at Fannie Allen Urgent Care. In this module, we're gonna talk about different skin biopsy techniques. The most common being a punch shave, and you can do a superficial or a deep shave or an excisional biopsy. For the punch, you're going to use a punch. For the shave, you could use a scalpel or a specialized tool like a derma blade, especially if you're going to be doing a deep shave, also called a saucerization. And for an excisional biopsy, that's something that you're going to mark out and use a scalpel to excise the lesion. The simplest of biopsies is doing a shave biopsy. Often you can raise the lesion a little bit by doing a subdermal anesthetic underneath it and you can use a scalpel or a dermal blade to shave off the lesion. Obviously, this doesn't give you full depth pathology, but it is a quick and easy procedure. To do a shave biopsy is frequently done, but really to get full depth pathology, doing a punch biopsy is the best option. You get full depth that you can send a pathology in a sample of formalin. Some of the smallest punches don't need a surgical repair. Others can be closed with a simple suture. Remember not to crush your biopsy and using a needle to manipulate it may be better. The excisional biopsy obviously removes a larger chunk of skin. It allows you to remove a certain margin around the visible lesion, which is obviously very important for malignancies. You always mark it out to make sure that you are removing a symmetric ellipse. And also this way you can get informed consent and be sure until you get into wounds that are too big or too deep, there really isn't much that you can't close with a simple suture, getting a good symmetric bite, and then usually closing it with an instrument tie. Try to always be doing something useful with your other hand, with the pickups, being ginger, but helping to position and move the skin. Try not to touch the tip of the needle with your pickups because you will dull the needle. You'll dull the needle pretty quickly and then doing an instrument tie, which we'll go over in a bit more detail in a minute. Carefully doing the first throw of that knot to close the wound. If you have a wound with a fair amount of tension, using a larger gauge suture, which will be on a bigger needle, which will cause you to do a bigger suture and using that first throw of the knot, which is the surgeon's knot, to have an extra wrap or two to be able to hold that tension across the wound. And then as you place additional sutures up and down this, it should bring it together fairly well. Mm -hmm. For suture tying, I almost exclusively do instrument ties, though you guys should learn how to do hand ties and they are ideal for tying around instruments. Uh, I find instrument ties end up being more efficient, saving suture and a little bit more quickly done. Pulling the suture through so you have a shorter tail, you go around twice to begin with and then you pull everything to the opposite side and cinch down. That first throw is called a surgeon's knot to allow it to hold some tension to let you do the next throw of the knot. 
The key thing is that you start with the instrument over the wound, pull everything to the opposite side, put the instrument over the wound, wrap, grab, everything goes to the opposite side. Instrument over the wound, wrap, grab, everything to the opposite side, each time making sure that that knot is horizontal as it comes down on top of the last throw. The surgeon's knot, you cinch in so that the wound is properly closed. And then as you go to the second and third knot, you pull it much tighter to cinch down the knot so that it does not come untied. This is a user perspective view the same thing. The key thing is that at least three to four throws of the knot for external knots, especially with synthetic suture. Don't do what I'm doing there and grab the tip of the needle. You pull the tail through. Instrument over. Two wraps and then pull it tight. Wound preparation includes applying an antiseptic. Irrigating and or debriding and doing anesthesia as well before you go to suture. You want to set up a sterile field and arrange your instruments and get everything ready. We really don't have enough time to go through the details of anesthesia, but there are local nerve and field type blocks. explore the wound, determine what structures need to get fixed, and whether or not this is something that would require a microsurgical repair or... The two anesthetics you're going to see in the clinic the most are lidocaine and marcaine, and the other bigger option is going to be the presence of epinephrine with a lidocaine or not. Here we see local anesthesia being done underneath the skin so it doesn't hurt and doing it on the cephalad end of the wound first so that they feel the lidocaine less on the lower end of the wound. When I was in medical school, I was trained that it was not safe to use lidocaine with epinephrine in the fingers, toes, penis, and nose, but it has been shown to be safe in fingers and in toes and in the penis and in the nose. And the reason I like to do it is that the lidocaine gives you fast onset anesthesia, faster than marcaine, but now with the lidocaine it lasts longer than the marcaine, there's less bleeding because of vasospasm because the lidocaine leaves the area of the wound more slowly, your uh, safe maximum dose is twice as high and you really do not get problems with infection, necrosis, uh, or allergies. So I tend to do it regularly, but you may find there's still some clinics that are practicing uh, somewhat apocryphal medicine and do not use lidocaine with epinephrine. The vertical mattress stitch allows you to hold a lot more tension across a wound, adjust the skin edges more precisely, keep them everted, and close a deeper space as well. This is one of the first stitches I'll go to when a simple stitch is not adequate. It is a little bit more complicated to sew in that there's a forehand throw, which is larger, and then a tinier backhand throw, and you tie it off to the side. So as seen here, you do a larger stitch that goes fairly deep and starts and comes out with a fairly significant margin away from the wound. You then set your needle facing the other direction and then do a backhand stitch that is tinier and is used for getting the skin edges in good apposition and everting the wound edges as well. And then obviously you're going to then be tying this off to one side.
the other thing that this stitch is good for is that if you have something like a cut on the bottom of the chin from falling and striking the ground, this actually keeps the suture material from crossing the incision itself. Some people feel more comfortable doing the backhand loop as the first stitch. Some people want to do the backhand loop as the second stitch. The other stitch is a horizontal mattress stitch, which is basically two large single stitches in parallel. The advantage here, though, is that the suture goes over a large amount of skin, everts the wound better, holds more tension, and you are also getting two stitches in for the time of tying one knot. But again, one of these stitches is a backhand stitch, so that may be something that would slow you down and may not be as fast as, say, a running stitch if you're just looking for speed overall. A lot of times you'll see a chevron-shaped tear or laceration, and you need to pull the apex back in. But doing that with simple interrupted stitches can end up just causing some necrosis. So instead, we end up using something called a corner stitch, which uses a subcuticular stitch through the apex of the tear that does not cut off circulation. You start beyond the apex of the wound and tunnel through and come out just in the subcuticular layer on the side of the wound, cross the apex of the wound as well through that same level and then come back on the other side of the wound, tunneling back up beyond the apex of the wound. We start and finish beyond the apex of the wound so that your knot tying does not distort the wound itself. This ends up being a fairly tricky stitch to tie, and it's even a little bit more awkward in a fake silicone skin model. Sometimes people will get more of a stellite burst type laceration with radiating arms, especially if they fall down and strike a chin or a brow against a hard flat surface. And you can run a corner stitch through multiple apices at once, and it's called a purse stitch in that setting.
One of the main advantages of a running stitch is that it is a lot faster to put in, tends to even out the tension along the incision and heals up quite well. The idea is that you put a loop at the far end, starting more at the end of the wound rather than a little bit into the wound. And that's because there's always a little bit of a diagonal pull around the first and last stitch of a running stitch. You tie that off, but don't cut your tail off. And then you simply work down and place sutures across the incision, just as if they were simple interrupted stitches. I tend to think that pointing the wound towards your elbow allows your suturing motion to be much more natural and allows you to see into the wound. The other trick is to try to always pull the needle out, either by grabbing it as you pull it out or holding it and pressing it against the skin so that it is quickly in position for your next stitch. Try not to spend a lot of time resetting the needle in the needle driver with every stitch because that'll slow you down significantly. So you can see I'm either positioning it against the skin or grabbing it as it comes out in a way that allows you to do the next stitch quickly. You also note that I'm using the suture to help position the skin. You could either do that or use your pickups. I tend to like to hold the tail of the suture because that maintains the tension. And that way, when you get done at the end, you don't have to really do much work going back and pulling all those throws tight. You definitely want to do a good job tying the knot off since having one knot come undone here ends up being pretty disastrous. The trick is you're going to tie <coughs> off onto a loop of your suture. It's essentially a normal instrument tie, but you're just pulling your loop through instead of a single tail. And this is another running stitch. I think it always makes sense to sew towards your elbow from far away to close to you so that you can see what you're doing a little bit better. This does not work for wounds that go from thin to thick skin, are over sharp corners, or have many bends or angles since the suture can shift and part of the wound can open up in those situations. Staplers are another way of getting a good quick closure. They work especially good in the scalp because it pulls the thick, stiff skin of the scalp together quite well. And it's much nicer to staple than to get your sutures all tangled up in hair. The stapler curls a stainless steel stapler around. You can either just place the stitch yourself or have an assistant hold the skin edges to get even more eversion with a pair of pickups. Staple removal is fairly easy with this specialized tool, but if you're really in a jam, you can use two hemostats or needle drivers to curl the outsides of the staple out and up. Methyl methacrylate, also known as superglue, is a great way to close wounds that lie or can be held closed. The glue goes over the wound and glues the epidermis together. You really do not want to let the 
glue get down into the wound because it's an inert substance and really does not disappear over time. Holding the wound together, you dab the glue on. I usually do a really tiny bead because that reacts with the moisture and the base in the wound to cure. And then you can add a bigger, wider bead over the top of that now that you're not so worried about the glue getting in the wound to help hold it closed. Another great trick is to use the hair from about an eight by eight millimeter spot on either side of the wound and do what's called a hair apposition technique, pulling and twisting the hair to hold a scalp wound closed. Okay. Right.